Lockdowns have been lifted in much of regional Victoria today, with 12 local government areas in regional New South Wales to enjoy more freedoms from tomorrow too. There were record numbers of cases for current COVID outbreaks in both states. New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian has defended the state's plan to ease restrictions once 70% of residents have been fully vaccinated. The Doherty plan, the national plan we've all signed up to, says it's 70% double dose. Every person who is fully, every adult who is fully vaccinated will be able to enjoy those things. The, the one condition is, uh, and that is condition of if there is a particular surge in a particular area or case numbers remain extremely high, we have to limit mobility. Jane Holton is the chair of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. I spoke to her earlier and started by asking what she makes of New South Wales's plan to reopen. Well, I think like any roadmap, PK, the question is, are we orienteering or are we driving straight to a destination? Um, we're going to see a few bumps on this road and it'll, go, it'll be a little bit rocky. The truth is, once we've got to 70%, we can do a lot more than we currently are doing and we should enable people to do that. We want people to get the benefit of going out and getting vaccinated. Um, but like everything, we're going to take this a day at a time, I think. Chief Health Officer Dr Kerry Chant was reported to have been hesitant to reopen until 80 to 85 per cent of the double dose vaccination mm. happened. Let's be honest here. Would that be a preferable path forward to ensure a sort of lower rate of infection and death? Look, it's so difficult, isn't it, to make these decisions. And of course, you're going to get less infections in the community when we're at 80% double dose. That's just self-evident. Um, but the issue is how long should we make people wait before they get some extra freedoms? Uh, the opportunity to go and have dinner with friends, the opportunity to have their hair cut, um, even the good old picnic, which everyone keeps talking about, let's hope it doesn't rain on picnic day. So, I mean, I understand her concern and I do think people should continue to be very careful. I mean, I, I'm a bit conservative myself on these things, PK, I'll feel more comfortable personally when we get to 80%. It doesn't mean I'm not going to go out, though. OK. Epidemiologists have called for more caution. Do you think hospitals will cope with this particular pathway? So the good thing about vaccines, PK, we've talked about this now, haven't we, so many times over the last few months, vaccines really do prevent severe disease and death. And that means they prevent hospitalizations. It doesn't mean we'll see no hospitalizations. It doesn't mean we'll see no deaths um, in that group, but they'll be so tiny uh, as a proportion that really we don't have to worry about it. And yes, it's the unvaccinated we have to be concerned about. We need to balance up the freedoms we get with the ability of our healthcare workers. And let's be really clear, we're not talking about the physical facilities. We know we've got lots of ventilators. We bought all those last year. It's our intensive care nurses. It's our doctors. It's our AMBOs. Um, have we got enough of them? Are they in the right place? So that's what they'll be watching really, really carefully. Should all of Sydney be under the same rules? Well, I don't live in Sydney, PK, and I'm always a little low <laughs> to give yeah, advice as a, as to people cons- living in Sydney. As a, as a you know, concept for both disease management and also equity. Mm. Yeah, well, I think the, the challenge with that position is that it means that regardless of where the outbreak is at a particular time, you potentially have the whole city locked down. And I think what we're going to see is these outbreaks roll into different areas. So I think potentially that means you've got a whole city locked down for months and months and months, when in fact, in some areas, you don't need to. So uh, my preference actually would not be, if we can, to lock everybody down, a bit like the state. Um, a bit like Victoria, we, we don't want to lock the whole country down either, PK, for the same reason. So my preference is to lock down only where needed, um, but obviously that's combined with vaccine. So if you've got high levels of vaccine coverage, high levels of double dose, you're less likely to need to lock down. The state's premier in, in New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, today announced an end to these 11am press conferences we've grown very accustomed to. Uh, Full Mm. disclosure, I've been very, very uh, critical of that personally. I think it's a very important accountability uh, mechanism for journalists, particularly as cases are rising. Do you Mm. think this is the right decision? Um, I suspect it's a bit early, actually, PK. I I think to your point, we're about to hit the peak, we think, of cases and then the issues for the hospital system. I can understand the criticism here. On the other hand, I also have uh, some sympathy for the Premier saying she's got to do her job, the rest of her job as well. But, you know, also, there is just a point where 
people probably need to focus on a few other things. Uh, I think the obsessive watching of the press conference every day, I know why people do it, but I don't know about you, I suspect my mental health is going to be a little better for it, PK, not to watch that conference every day, just to look at the numbers and go, mm, okay, that's where it is now, and now go back to what I, yeah. I'm otherwise doing. Yeah, but, so but in my understand. view, there's a couple of things on this. One thing is people can make mm. that own choice. It's called agency, right? You go, well, I don't want to watch it. It's true. Not, yeah, and I've done that on, on the weekend. I do that. I'm like, no, mm. I don't need this. No. Right? That's mm. your choice. And then there's the ratings, and I've been looking at them here for our own channel. There is huge mm. and overwhelming interest. Interest. And that's people's choice, yeah. whether we think it's morbid or not. And then there's the accountability part. Mm. I mean, surely we have to wait to deal with the, the spike and the cases and, and the reopening before you stop this thing. Yeah, well, as I said, PK, I'm a little surprised that it is this early. Um, I could certainly see a position in maybe uh, uh, October where we'd all go, yeah, okay, we've seen that peak, we know what it looks like. But yes, I, I, I'm not unsympathetic to your view. It's a little premature. Now, almost all states are not completely keeping to the national plan. How important is that we is it that we have this consistency across the country? Because right now there's there's all sorts of different COVID stories across our country. New South Wales is like mm. a completely different place to WA. Yeah, that's true. And at one level, um, of course, and sadly, New South Wales is where we've had this transmission event coming out of a, a driver. You know, at the end of that, it happened. And now we've got this happening. That's not happening elsewhere. So I think it's probably the next or well, maybe a few months, we're going to see a difference across our country. In time, uh, the reality is everyone is going to be exposed to this experience, hopefully after everyone's really well covered with the vaccine. So I'm not surprised we're at different points just at this particular moment. I've always said this year was going to be more difficult and quite bumpy. And uh, the truth is, we all hope by Christmas we're in a much better position and actually people can go and see their family regardless of what state they're in. But we've got a way to go yet, PK, and I don't really want to get out my crystal ball as to where we're going to be at Christmas time because I think it's a bit hard to tell. Mm, well, we got it wrong last Christmas, I can tell you, um, with that uh, that situation Sydney found itself in. It was not quite yeah. what people had predicted. Now, proof no. of vaccination will be required to go to cafes and restaurants and for things like even getting a haircut. How can that be policed? Mm. Well, there's two things here. Um, the first of which is uh, the authorities have got to get the technology right. And we all know that there's this thing called the Australian Immunisation Register, e easily referred to as AIR. And that's what records uh, whether you've had one dose or whether you've had two dose. Uh, in fact, I've actually got mine downloaded on my phone. And uh, some of the states and territories are looking to see whether they can actually get some sort of a tick or a certificate from uh, that registry into their restaurant check-in or that you know the check-in app that we all use on our phones as we you know show it at the uh, at the door and get in. So that will be the easiest thing. There's a way to go, I think, before they can do that technically. Now we also know you can print out that certificate. Um, I think PK, you and I would be a bit worried if people were running around with printed certificates because, as we know, that's kind of easy not to um, be the real thing. So let's hope that they get the technology worked out. Documents released under FOI earlier this week suggest a health minister. To Greg Hunt's office, didn't meet with Pfizer about its COVID vaccination until August last year. That's more than a month after the manufacturer sought a meeting with the minister at the earliest opportunity. Three months later, Australia signed its first deal. Was that a missed opportunity? Should the health minister have just met with Pfizer at that time? Well, we weren't there, PK, so we don't know. Um, the truth of the matter is there were deals being done elsewhere around the world, uh, but we don't know where the company was placing its priority. Uh, we have seen correspondence, including some emails. Uh, truth is, we did the deal when we did the deal, and the good news is we've got Pfizer coming. Uh, I think all of us would be happy uh, if we had access earlier than we did. But as you and I've talked about, PK, there is an enormous global shortage to this day of vaccine. If you look at how much vaccine coverage there is in Africa, even in our near neighbours, it's well behind what we've got. So I, I'm doing the glass half full here. Um, we've got good access and we will get to 70% and in some places probably 80% in October of this year if people keep coming out. That's really good. So yes, I'd have liked to have access to vaccines earlier. I'm sure you would have done, but the good news is I've already had my two shots and I'm hoping everyone else is lined up. That's Jane Holton, the Chair of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. This is RN Drive 0418 226 576 is the text line.